before I get into that, I want to talk a little bit about DNA. I'm sure you've all heard about DNA. Um, it's something that we have in every single cell in our body, and it's kind of unique to each of our, each and in each one of us. Um, essentially, what DNA is is a think about it. It's a blueprint for um, the construction of these things called proteins and enzymes. Enzymes, and the blueprints are actually called genes. And each one of these genes is a blueprint for a protein or an enzyme. And when this gene is expressed, it that means that this protein is made. So when I say expression, it means that a gene makes a protein. Okay, now I focus on development, and during development, there's actually a beautiful orchestration of um, and temporal and spatial orchestration of specific proteins and genes being expressed to make you who you are. So that's why I like to use the analogy of an orchestra. So you can imagine the DNA is actually a conductor or sheet music, which says which instrument to play at what time. And you can imagine similar to um, when you hear a symphony play or a music play, if you lose one instrument, especially a drum, you lose uh, something from that music. So I like to look at what happens when you lose a gene from the body and how that affects development. And I use the fruit fly, specifically color vision in the fruit fly, because uh, it's, we can study at how this, we can, there's many layers of study that you can go into. So we can start at the behavior level and say, take out this gene and say, what happens? If we find a gene of interest, we can go a little bit deeper and say, what's happening in the system? What's happening in the entire <coughs> system? Uh, and if we find something there, we can go a little bit deeper to the single cell. So the system is made up of many different cell types. And if we look at individual cell types, we can say, OK, this is where this single gene is working. And finally, we can go within that cell at the synaptic or subcellular level and say, OK, this is where, it's, where this gene uh, or instrument is involved in function. So, so what I discovered was that, um, as I said, I, I work in color vision. So flies have this preference to move towards light sources. So like, you know, at night when you see a moth going towards a light. Um, but in the color vision, flies predominantly see UV or blue light. So in a control fly, um, uh, what's his name? you can put flies at a choice point, And they will distribute evenly between both UV and blue light source because they can detect both the UV and the blue light source. Now, when I take out this, uh, when I remove expression of this protein named borderless, you'll see that these flies have a striking preference for UV light, and they don't move towards the blue light side. And I quantified this in the graph here, so you can see that in two different uh, forms of train, train off expression of this borderless protein, these flies cannot detect blue light. Now, I want to say, OK, so I have this behavioral, behavioral, uh, behavioral phenotype, what's happening in the anatomy. And in the wild type animal, the control animal, there's this protein in green that's important for synaptic function. So remember, Chris talked about how you have neurotransmitter release, and these synapses are for location. Now, in the animal that has a decrease in borderless expression, these green proteins are mislocalized to an area of the brain or the visual system they're not supposed to be. So I have this behavioral phenotype that is um, can, that has supporting evidence within the anatomy and the cellular, cellular level. And it's important to note that these, these neurons are actually um, specific for blue light detection. So what is, what is borderless? And essentially, it is an adhesion molecule. And what that means is that, like its name says, it helps things stick together. So at this, at this synapse, you have um, neurotransmitter release. But these neurons need to know that they need to stick together. It's kind of like Velcro. If there's not Velcro there, they won't stick together, and they won't be in close enough proximity for this signal to be sent across. And why do we care? And especially, why do we care about the fruit fly? And I always like to go to this 1958 uh, image from a fly, where uh, a scientist, uh, I'm, I'm sure you've all seen, like they recreated in the 80s, I think, with Jeff Goldblum. But the scientist gets stuck in a transporter <laughs> with a fly. And there's a sharing of genetic information. And people's like, oh, that's horrific, blah, blah, blah. But I, when I see this, I think this is really cool. And it kind of brings together um, why we should study these lower organisms. Because there's something um, essential that's shared between us. And that is, in fact, DNA. So what we can do is I can study borderless, look at the gene that expresses this borderless protein, understand how it functions. And then I can go to the DNA and look at that blueprint. And I can take that blueprint, compare it to um, the 
human genome or DNA in the human and say, well, what proteins are expressed? And are they expressed in the brain? And what functions might they have? And coincidentally, there's a homologue uh, for borderless in animals called IG79B. And it has a role in inhibitory synapse formation. So it might suggest that um, us understanding borderless in the fly might shed light on inhibitory synapse formation uh, uh, diseases such as epilepsy. So thank you. <laughs>